Today, we are recording this on May 24th, 2022. And as you can see, we're going to get into the buy-sell agreement. And I'm going to refer to these when we do these ones as the legal look-in. So purchase agreements, that's going to be the key. So jump in. Uh, I've got uh, John Lafferty watching chat room for us with any questions in there. And don't be afraid to jump in because this is going to be a lot more fun when you guys are giving us some feedback. So uh, all things working here, we're gonna get this up and rolling. First question, my buyer just entered into a purchase agreement to buy a home. The listing agent is continuing to market the seller's property. Can they do that? What say you? And by the way, I'm just going to let you guys kind of hang there a little bit. Uh, I want you to stew on that. Maybe even keep track of a few notes as to what you're thinking. Can they continue to market the property? And the answer is... Backup offers? backup uh, offers? Well, yeah, they, they... Well, I guess in simplest, Brenda, yes, they can do it. But it does depend. So the seller and their agents may continue to market the property even after they've entered into a binding purchase agreement. Now, guys, remember, it doesn't mean that they can accept an offer that would substitute, but they could continue to advertise. Now, the key is, what is the purchase agreement saying that uh, you can do? And here's the question, very specifically, because now we're talking about Century 21 and Cobol Banker uh, under the HRC umbrella, what does the purchase agreement say when we write an offer on our purchase agreement and a seller accepts it? Does anybody know? I do believe it says that you must stop marketing and showing the property once you accept the offer. So if you could hear John into the background here, that it says once you uh, enter into a binding agreement, using either one of our purchase agreements, and it's either gonna be paragraph 30 or paragraph 31 on uh, the gold side, it says, showings, seller agrees that property will be marked pending and no further showings will be allowed. So if they've accepted our purchase agreement as written and they didn't cancel that out, paragraph 30 says, no, you can't, but, by law, there's, they have every right to be able to do it unless if the purchase agreement states otherwise. All right, let's see. So continuing on. Question. I represented a buyer in the purchase of a house that closed this past summer. The buyer discovered some issues with water in the basement that the seller did not disclose. My buyer wants to take the seller to arbitration but both parties left the section in the purchase agreement on arbitration blank. Can the buyer require the seller uh, to arbitrate this particular dispute? So here's the rough situation. We have it on our purchase agreement and it says that is paragraph Where's our arbitration at? Yeah, it's always when I want to go find it really quick. I should give you the other part here. Somebody tell me if you find it first. Right? It's, it's always obvious until... It's number 34. Number 34. There, yeah, it is at the bottom of the page. <laughs> Thank you, John. So at the bottom, it says parties do or do not wish to arbitrate. So in this case, they didn't even initial it. Nothing was said either way. So can it be forced upon? And the answer is no. Uh, the, the bottom line being, if they didn't do it, it goes by what the purchase agreement says, but if the purchase agreement, one left it or both 
left it, then you cannot force the other party to actually go into arbitration. Unless, in this case, the seller actually agreed to go to arbitration instead of going to a court. You know, my recommendation, if you watch the videos regarding completing the purchase agreement, I learned uh, from a good friend, many of you know Tom Kotzian, and Tom said, don't waive your right to a jury trial. You can always choose to arbitrate later, but this is an agreeing in advance of it. So my guidance has always been, do not agree to arbitrate. You can always do it later. Next question, the purchase agreement says that the seller shall surrender possession of the home on August 1st at 12 a.m. Some of you are seeing an issue with this already. Is a seller entitled to possession for the entire day on August 1st? Otherwise, when is 12 a.m.? When it's 12 p.m. And I'm not going to have anybody answer because you might get it wrong, <laughs> which is the whole problem with this scenario. You I'll see, what is 12 a.m.? Midnight. 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 You got it. 12 a.m. is actually midnight. Now, a lot of people don't know that. Therefore, yeah, we had reactions in here. <laughs> But trust me, there's many people who have to sit back and go, wait a minute, is 12 a.m. midnight or is that noon? Because when, when does it switch over? Well, it's because of that confusion and we want to avoid it that it is strongly recommended that we go to 11.59 p.m. or a 12.01 a.m. or 11.59 a.m. or a 12... You just get it that one minute before that one minute after because everybody knows what 11.59 a.m. and p.m. are. So to avoid a confusion, strongly encouraged, use 11.59 or 12.01. Do not use 12 a.m. or 12 p.m. Darwin, uh, something in chat here, going back to the previous art regarding arbitration. If they don't check anything, can they decide later to go to check it? Ah, so going back to the arbitration question, can they later go back and agree or initial? And the answer would be yes, but what are they doing to the contract at that point? They're doing an amendment. So the answer is yes, it can always go back to, but at that point, once it's been fully executed, we're amending the contract so that the parties would be agreeing to do so. Obviously, you're probably past that at that point. When you get to the point of discussing arbitration later on, it's probably because you're already in a point of saying, no, you can't, and yes, we can, and now they're fighting in a legal dispute. What's well, a good time to have the discussion? Ah, a question came in here. What might be a good time to turn possession? A little bit of that, I would say right now, and especially this market, discuss that with the listing agent. Find out what the seller might need or require. I would tell you that often it is noon or five. Otherwise, 11.59 a.m. or 5 p.m., Typically, that's when you want to do it. But I have a tendency to prefer 1159 if it's specified. But quite often, it's not even specified. Uh, as a matter of fact, our purchase agreements are written in such a way that it says, Possession, paragraph 8. Seller shall deliver possession to the buyer at closing or within blank days after closing to apply if no choice is made. The position not uh, delivered by or at closing from and including the day of the day to do so. That's gonna be some of, uh, gosh, we don't even put a time on it. So typically you just say 11.59 p.m. Yeah, so if, if it's important, 
you're going to want to specify. I'll tell you what I have seen more often than not, when there is post, post closing occupancy, the escrow agent or the closing, the title company will actually specify it on a close or the post occupancy agreement, which would address the, if there was actually a per diem being charged. All right. So this is an interesting one. And with the way that things are going right now in the real estate industry and the class action lawsuits that are out there and the DOJ fighting uh, how we work with each other and coordinate and compensate each other, question comes up this. Can a buyer's agent write into a purchase agreement that the seller agrees to pay a higher commission than what is being offered through the MLS? Simply put, can we, as a buyer's agent, write it on the purchase agreement that we get X amount? And then a question comes up, if we were to do that, could it be considered an ethics violation? Now, if I had you guys talking out there, we'd have quite a conversation going on right now because there's a whole lot of stuff that goes into, are you in trouble or are you not if you were to do something like this? So let's take a look. To start with, we got to see standards of practice 1616, which states realtors acting as sub agents or buyer tenant representatives or brokers shall not use the terms of an offer to purchase or lease to attempt to modify the listing broker's offer of compensation to sub agents or buyer agents, representatives or brokers, nor make the submission of an executed offer to purchase lease agreement. Uh, contingent on the listing broker's agreement to modify the offer of compensation. So if there was somebody out there who was offering 1% and you wanted 3%, there's a whole lot of things that are going to go into whether or not you can do what we're talking about. Now, let's be real clear. You, as an agent, we as a broker, cannot get our commission or negotiate our commission. We can't do that. We cannot, we cannot get that in the way of an offer or on the offer, we can't do it. But can the buyer request that the seller pay their buyer's broker's fee? The answer is yes. But if you're going to do that, you've got to make sure there's a whole lot of things in place. With the biggest one being that the buyer wants it done that way. Now, why would a buyer say that I want my buyer's agent to be compensated a total of? And we can talk because we are one firm with a minimum standard 3%. Well, if we've one, signed the agency disclosure. Because by law, prior to the exchange of any confidential information, we will disclose in writing to all parties. Which then should immediately follow with the buyer representation contract. And if that contract specifies that the buyer is responsible to pay you blank percent of which more often than not, we're going to collect that either from the seller or the seller's broker. And the buyer and understanding that we're only getting in the scenario I was using 1% from the listing broker, the buyer's understanding that they still owe us 2% could ask the seller through their purchase agreement that the seller would be responsible to pay the buyer's broker's fee of an additional 2%. What I'm gonna tell you is when you do that, make sure that you're working with your manager directly because what we don't wanna end up as 
is in an arbitration panel before our peers because we screwed up and we didn't write something up correctly, or we flat out got greedy and we were asking for monies that we shouldn't have been asking for. Hope that makes sense. Anything come up in there, John, as far as? Yeah, just an additional question regarding, uh, I'll just use the right answer. So uh, if, if, a, if a purchaser buys a house and it's rented uh, and tenant's staying uh, on date of closing, who gets the money for the rent? It's prorated typically. So when a buyer closes on the house, however many, so today is the, 24th. So if there's seven days left in the month, then the buyer would receive seven days. Well, actually today's closing. So six days of compensation for the rent for the rest of the month. And then starting June would receive the full amount. Is that correct? I would believe that to be correct. Uh, and a matter of fact, another thing to look at regarding possession, often the uh, post closing occupancy agreement will state does the day of closing actually count as one of the days? So that's a point of clarification. Almost always, and I would share with you, if you were coming up to me with a question regarding a transaction, first thing I'm gonna have you do is go grab all the paperwork. Even if it's our purchase agreement, I'm gonna have you grab our purchase agreement because we need to know the specific wording to a scenario. So uh, John gave a, gave a great answer. And, and so, yes, we just got to take a look at all of that together. So moving on then, the question, I am representing a buyer in connection with the purchase of a home. The agreed upon closing date is on or before January 4th. My client is ready to close and wants to schedule the closing date earlier than January 4th. Is the seller obligated to close at an earlier date? So our purchase agreement is actually written this way. Can, it says to close on or before. So knowing that you've all kind of got your thoughts together as to what that answer would be. No, we cannot force another party to close before that date. It just says that on or before. It's typical language, it's interpreted to mean that once all the parties are ready, really, you could, if all the parties were ready prior to, you could close early, but neither party would be required to do so. Question, the listing ticket, the profile form. Oh, these are one of my favorites too. It included that there were personal property, and I'm gonna use personal property items that the buyers assumed that it was therefore, it was on the listing ticket, therefore they would be included on the transaction and didn't expressly reference them on the purchase agreement. So listing ticket had the typical washer, dryer, stove, refrigerator, dishwasher, right? It was on the listing ticket. The agent in helping the buyer put together the offer didn't list them out. So now the sellers are saying that they aren't take or they are not leaving them, they're taking them because the buyer didn't put it on the contract. The question is, is the seller correct? Can the seller take the appliances when they're not included? What say you? Are we ready? Everybody's committed. I'm going to tell you that pretty clearly versus what the answer is, is that Mar gave us. No, they can't have, or yes, they can take them. No, it's not the buyers. As you can read here, uh, I'll let you read, but my simplification, I hope to it is this. Who is the listing agreement between and how we market that? Is That's not between the seller and the buyer, is it? That's between the seller and us as a broker. The seller gave us permission to market the property a particular way. They, they basically on the listing agreement said, for 300,000 people can have all of the appliances and we listed them out. 
So now somebody comes in and offers $299,999.99. Do they or are they included? No, they're not. Unless they're on the purchase agreement. Because the purchase agreement, the buy-sell agreement, whichever way you refer to it, is the agreement between the buyer and the seller. How we promote it is a different thing. Now, this has got a long answer because, as you can see, the general definition of is anything that cannot be removed without damaging itself or the surroundings. Um, I like to refer to it as if it's glued or screwed, it stays, right? And, and, oh, by the way, if you really think about it, we don't sell houses. We sell dirt and any of the improvements to it. And when we sell the dirt, there's typically a house on it. And now that house is considered part of the dirt. And anything permanently affixed to that house is considered part of the dirt. Otherwise, it's real property. Anything not affixed is personal property. And this goes in to explain that, you know, a seller's attorney would argue that since the listing ticket is not an offer to purchase, it cannot be accepted and the item would not be included. But they go on to state that a buyer's attorney, on the other hand, is going to argue that the listing attack, uh, ticket is, in fact, an advertisement, and that a buyer should be entitled to rely on the fact that the home, if purchased, will include all the advertised items. Now, I believe that a, an attorney, now, this is just me, and I am not an attorney, so we all know that disclosure. I've got that covered. But if I offered it for 300000 with all those items, and you came along and offered 300000 just the way it was listed all the way through, and you didn't put those items, I got a feeling that that attorney might have something to stand on. But if it's anything less than that, then I don't think they've got anything to stand on. And I can tell you that I personally ran into it, where somebody was negotiating and they offered far less with all the appliances on the purchase agreement. They came in and they uh, offered the same amount, but without all the appliances. In the eyes of the, the seller, these were $5,000 worth of appliances. It was gonna cost them five grand to leave them. So when they saw the second offer without the appliances on it, they agreed. And then they took the, home, the appliances with them. Three days after closing, the buyers took possession and found no appliances. Guess what I got? Oh, yeah, you love those phone calls. Of which it was Darwin, there's no appliances. I said, well, yeah, because the offer we accepted had no appliances on it. She even went to the point of saying, but Darwin, it was on the listing ticket. I said, it was. And she, and she said, and, and it was even on the seller's disclosure statements. I said, they were. And you got the house for 225000 instead of the 235000 that we were offering it for. And if you'd offered two thirty five, they'd have happily left the appliances. But your buyers didn't. And therefore, when you came back with an agreement that had no appliances on it, it was doable and workable for the seller. She, I'm sure, ended up having to work something out because I never heard anything from her after that mm -hmm. because they were not on the purchase agreement and it was an offer substantially less than the price that it was marketed at. So there really is a big difference. And I want you to know, let me see if I can do this without uh, screwing anything up here. I want you to take a look. You should be seeing now uh, hopefully, no, you're not seeing this, are you, John? All right, let me stop that, share, and I want you to see, I think this is important. I want you to see the seller's disclosure statements. Mm -hmm. And right here, appliances, systems, services, the items below are in working order. The, listed, the items listed below are included in the sale of the property. And what does it say? Only if the purchase agreement so provides. 
if anyone, and if you're in this business for any time after this, believe me, somebody's going to say, but gee, Brenda, it was even on the seller's disclosure. Yes. And we also gave you the property for less than what we marketed at. So bottom line becomes this. If you were offering all those appliances and that purchase price is at or above what you were offering it for sale at, you'd better get clarification as to whether or not the buyer intended for those appliances to be on that. Hopefully that makes sense. And I'm going to get the PowerPoint back up here for us. Didn't do it, did it? Doggone rookies, you think they didn't know how to operate this. Let me go back. Hold this guy back up. Screen share. Hopefully that's something that you guys are going to do. I'll tell you, I've relied on it numerous times. And I had to point it out because it's unbelievable how many agents don't know that that statement is on there. All right. Next question is somewhere coming up. Oh, yes. I knew there was a reason I put that in there. When in doubt, write it out. I always say that if you get the buyer and they walk past something and they go, ooh. And you go, well, that's a fixed. Write it out. You don't want that puppy not being there when they take possession of the property. When in doubt, write it out. Next question, our seller client has entered into a purchase agreement, but now does not want to sell. Are we ever going to run into this? Have we run into this? And the answer is yes. Uh, my client has asked us, was to figure out how to get them out of that contract, out of that deal. What do we do? Can we, should we? Help them get out of the contract. Answer is, don't do it. <laughs> While we may know from experience how to be able to get the client out of it without any liability, we have to resist the urge to do so. You see, the, the problem is, is you're offering legal advice. We can't do that. We're at that point practicing law, and obviously at that point, we're violating the rules and regulations of what we can do. The appropriate response to the question is tell your client to just go speak with an attorney. You need to get legal guidance if you want to break this contract. Fair enough? I have a listing on a home owned by a married couple. Currently, the wife is out of town on business, but they want to accept an offer. All the time, guys. Can the husband sign a contract on the wife's behalf and make this a binding contract? We won't even give you the full 30 seconds for Jeopardy's answer. We know it's not a binding contract if they were to do that. In order for it to be a binding contract, both the husband and wife would have to sign a purchase agreement. The husband would be able to sign on his wife's behalf only if she had given him her power of attorney, otherwise the POA that you hear it for short. Of course, often a contract expressly st states that the parties may sign and deliver acceptance electronically, otherwise digital signatures, uh, transaction desk DocuSign, and all the others that exist, including everybody's now favorite, Docs Plus. Question, can I, what time is it? Holy cow, I didn't even get all the way through all of them. Um, this is a quick one. I represent sellers listing broker. An offer came in from another office, but my seller is currently out of town and cannot be reached. Seller authorized me via telephone to accept the offer on my seller's behalf. Is this an enforceable contract? And again, less than the typical Jeopardy time to make the answer or give the question. No. A broker can, can a broker may sign a binding purchase agreement on behalf of the buyer or seller only if 
they have explicit written authority to do so. By the way, we don't want you doing this. We don't want you taking power of attorney or the POA. We do not want you doing that. You are accepting far more responsibility and typically they have someone that they could give the POA to. Verbal authority over the phone would not be sufficient. A listing agreement by itself does not give the broker authority to bind his or her principal to a contract for the sale of land. So I'll finish with that one thing and we're gonna call it good. Um, we'll pick back up with a few more on the buy sell agreement so that we're holding time. I wanna say thank you for hanging out today. Another end to the hot topic Tuesday. And by the way, if there is any questions regarding last week's conversations with Phil. I'm gonna hang out here for a little bit and you guys can ask those questions if you need that clarification. So another end to Hot Topic Tuesday. See you next week.